some music to accompany, you know, my sermon. I thought maybe that would make it more full and add some context. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, well, thank you, Lord, for humbling me this morning. Uh, okay. So, as you can see on the slide, um, my sermon today is entitled Reconciliation, Not Condemnation, or Instead of Condemnation. And so, as I was kind of going through this week, um, I've been listening to, actually it's the Michigan uh, conference, or I'm sorry, camp meeting. And uh, if you ever get a chance on Audioverse, a lot of times I'm up here and pushing Audioverse. If you don't have it, there's an app. I strongly suggest downloading it. You can just listen to some amazing content. And, you know, it's so easy for, easy for us when we're in our cars to listen to the radio or, you know, there's a lot of garbage out there. But it, I just want to promote, you know, listening to Audioverse. It, it's, it's pretty nice instead of... Uh, listening to the other things that the world has to offer. You can listen to these amazing sermons that just really uplift your day, and, or if you're driving to and fro, you know, even when you're working out, uh, it's such a blessing. So, anyway, I was listening to um, the um, camp meeting in Michigan, and they had some amazing speakers there, uh, so you should check it out on Audioverse. But it kind of inspired me, and I'd heard this... Um, well, I guess um, it wasn't necessarily a verse, but it was a, a, a kind of a command for God's people that I hadn't heard before, um, speaking of this reconciliation instead of condemnation. And we'll go into that later. I'll read from the Spirit of Prophecy where we kind of have this mission. But first I'm going to tell you a story. And this story is about a young man named Bud. He was born December 30th, 1940, into an SDA family, and he had six sisters and one brother, making a total of eight children. And as he grew up, he started dating this beautiful woman from the Cape Verde Islands named Julie. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Cape Verde Islands, but they're off the coast of Africa, and some amazing people live there. And so, this gentleman, Bud, happened to meet a beautiful representative of Cape Verde, and they were dating. And uh, now, while he was still dating Julie, um, he was actually then introduced to another lady named Mary Ann. And she was, uh, oh, I forgot to mention that Bud it was raised in a Seventh-day Adventist family, and some of his cousins were going to PUC, and they made friends with this woman named Mary Ann while there. And they thought that she would be a perfect match for Bud. Sometimes it's kind of trouble, problematic when we get in and we, we want to be matchmakers for other people, especially when they're in another relationship. <laughs> And so, anyway, to make a long story short, they uh, end up introducing Bud to Mary Ann, and then he starts kind of undergoing some pressure because Julie, who he was dating from the, from the islands, although she, while in the islands, had gone to some Seventh-day Adventist schools, um, she wasn't necessarily a Seventh-day Adventist. And so Bud's mother was giving him some grief about that, and there was this other opportunity with Mary Ann. And so, it hurt, you know, and also not to mention that they were friends with his cousins that were close to him in age, and uh, then he started dating Mary Ann. Well, I guess they must have, been, must have been dating both of them at the same time, and even though he was a Seventh-day Adventist, you know, sometimes um, things happen and you get a little carried away and it turned out that before he knew it, Julie was pregnant. And around the same time, Marianne was pregnant as well. So quite a conundrum that was created at this time. And um, so what to do? So, of course, what Bud 
did is he gave in to the, the pressure of his family and thinking that maybe Marianne would be a better life partner for him, so he Mary ended up marrying Marianne. But unfortunately, to the detriment of Julie and her daughter. So he, unfortunately, because of being with Marianne, Marianne, I guess, didn't really want him to interact with Julie. I'm sure there was some jealousy. Um, makes sense that there would be. And so he really didn't have a role in his daughter's life, whose name is Darlene. And so time goes on, and we fast forward to 20 years had gone by. And at this time, um, Darlene needed a birth certificate for something. Um, I think she was applying for a job, or there was something where she needed her birth certificate. And I forgot to mention that actually, um, that Julie ended up actually marrying this really nice guy named Richard, and uh, he took care of Darlene like she was his own child. This was a really a huge blessing to Darlene. And, and I guess they never told Darlene that her actual father was Bud. She always thought that Richard was her father. And so she comes to this time where she needs this birth certificate. And sadly, you know, she's in her 20s. And she finally, you know, in looking at this birth certificate, sees a different name on her birth certificate, birth certificate as her father than Richard. She sees Bud's name. And boy, was she surprised. And so then she, you know, she was curious, well, who's this Bud character? He hasn't played any role in my life. What is he all about? And so she decides that she actually wants to interact with, with Bud to get to know, you know, what her history is, who her, her biological father truly is. And so she starts connecting with, with Bud and Bud obviously connecting back, and, and he's interested as well. At this stage, um, his wife Marianne had passed away, and uh, he was a single father taking care of uh, two sons, but he wanted this opportunity to finally reconnect with his daughter, and I'm sure there's some guilt over the years for his lack of involvement with her. Um, and so he gets to know Darlene, and, and unfortunately he hasn't been in Darlene's life all these years and hasn't had the opportunity to have an impact on her and her way of life. And so she was um, living a more worldly life than, than he would have liked, and, and he witnesses this, and so he then unfortunately, you know, it turns out that Darlene is, you know, it, I think, well, Bud has forgotten the idea that the sins of the father are passed on to the third and fourth generation. And here, Darlene has a couple of boyfriends. And um, she's not quite ready to settle down. And then Bud, actually, in noticing this and, and thinking, you know, hey, I have to do something. I have to kind of impose my ideas upon her. But he doesn't tell her specifically he goes to her mother, Julie, and says, unfortunately, he uses the, the, the sad words of, I, you know, it's, I think Darlene is acting like a harlot. Not thinking um, that that would get back to Darlene. Now, I think that there's so many lessons to learn within this story, but one of those is be careful what you say. Um, even if you're saying it to someone, especially if you're saying it to someone else, because it could get to them, and that could uh, create some damage. So, um, so this news of what Bud had said about his daughter, of course, gets back to her, and Darlene's thinking, man, what a hypocritical man. Here he is, you know, he, you know, wasn't in my life for my entire life. He, uh, wasn't there for me. He, he, so he basically had given up that opportunity to mold me. And then when we finally get this chance to meet, you know, many years later when I'm an adult, 
then he wants to say these kind of things about me. And so it's unfortunate that that was said because uh, instead of Bud being able to reconcile his relationship with his daughter, he pushed her away with a judgmental word to his daughter's mother. The sad news is he was able to make amends. He wasn't able to make amends for his error. That stain that he made in just a word is still imprinted in the mind of his daughter. And so instead of reflecting a merciful, loving God that desires us to come to him as we are, and he will do the changing, he reflected Satan's version of a judgmental God that condemns. So I think the story is a story that we can all, you know, that we can all apply to our lives when we're thinking about others maybe that are coming into the church, maybe others that are in the church. Uh, you know, we talk about gossip and, and, and you know, that we shouldn't be uh, engaging in that. And, you know, so that can lead to things. But it's just really what I want to convey today is just this idea that, you know, we, we, we don't need to be judgmental. Uh, yes, we've been blessed with the truth, uh, with, with a, a vast amount of truth, I should say. Um, but we shouldn't use that to hit people over the head with it, right? We shouldn't cast judgment on them. Instead, we want to be reflecting a Christ that loves them, that desires to get to know them. And if we just, if we paint this picture of a loving God, I think people will come to him, and, and then God can do the changing. That's not on us to do. So I think in, in reflecting on the story, Bud's story, I think Bud kind of acted like the ungrateful servant found in Matthew 8, 23 through 35. Uh, you know, Bud owed so much to God for God being so merciful and forgiving in his multi, uh, multitude of sins, and in reconciling him with himself, with God. But then, Bud then turns around and casts his daughter into spiritual prison, so to speak, for committing far fewer transgressions. The Bible tells us that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Our job is not one of judgment, thank God, but one of reconciliation. So when we serve God like the devil, we are instilling the wrong picture of God in the minds of those we are trying to lead to him. So sometimes we can, we, you know, we think we're working for God, but in actuality we're working for God like the devil. To paint the picture that he's been casting over all these years. This fake understanding of who God is, showing this judgmental God when really we serve a God that is a loving God. And this also reminds me of the story of the woman caught in adultery that's found in John 8, 1 through 11. If you remember the story, uh, these men bring, you know, bring this woman supposedly caught in adultery to Jesus, and they ask the question, what should we do with this woman? And he's writing in the sand, and he says, you know, he who uh, has no sin, cast the first, uh, let him cast the first stone. And some time goes by, and I think their conscience grabbed each one of them, and they slowly went away, and he looks up, and he asks the woman, woman, where are thine accusers? And she says, they're no longer here. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So that is what our calling is. Is to again show that God is not a condemning God. He desires our good. He doesn't want to take things that are good away from us. He just wants to bring us to him where all things flow. All the goodness of life can be flown to us. That we could have a little taste of heaven on earth. So we find in Mount of Blessings, page 22, three, or 22 uh, paragraph 3, um, this is where I, I found this.
this kind of calling for, for us as God's end time people. It says, the merciful are partakers of the divine. I'm sorry. The merciful are partakers of the divine nature. And in them, the compassionate love of God finds expression. All whose hearts are in sympathy with the heart of infinite love will seek to reclaim and not to condemn. Christ dwelling in the soul is a spring that never runs dry. Where he abides, there will be an overflowing of beneficence. So if we truly have Christ in our soul, we will reflect that in how we interact with one another. To appeal of the erring, the tempted, the wretched victim of want and sin, the Christian does not ask, are they worthy? But how can I benefit them? That should be the question that we ask ourselves each and every day when we're interacting with other people. No sin is too great for God, right? He loves each and every one. I mean, he says that even while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we need to look at each individual in the same light. That God loves everyone in this world, not just those in this church. So in the most wretched, the most debased, he sees souls whom Christ died to save, and for whom God has given to his children the ministry of reconciliation. Right, so that is our ministry, to bring those that are lost to the Savior so that they might be saved. I also think about the story of the prodigal son found in Luke 15, 11 through 32. You're all familiar with the story, right? This, this wonderful father, great wealth, has these two sons. And one of them decides that he wants to go experience life apart from what his father had planned for him. And he asks for his inheritance. And he goes out into the world and he squanders his inheritance on worldly living. And eventually he finds that money can't buy you happiness, especially when money is all gone. And he realized how much better he had it with his father, that even his father's servants have it better than him at this point. And so he decides to go back home, thinking that even if I just ask my father to be, you know, to tell him that I'm no longer worthy to be called his son, that I would be willing just to be a servant in your household. And I know that I would have more as a servant in your household than someone living in the world. And so when the son had chosen to go back to his father's house, even before he had confessed his sins, if you see the story, the father had compassion on him and ran to him and embracing him and kissed him. That's what our loving father wants to do for us. Right? He wants to embrace us. He wants to kiss us. He just wants to be with us. Then while in the, in the embrace, the son confesses his sins and his father had already forgiven him and tells his servant to put his princely robe on him and to make provisions for a great celebration. God doesn't wait even for us to confess to change. He's going to do the changing in us. He just wants us to make that choice today to come to Him. So we, so I know all of us are, we're here, right? And so we're showing that we're desiring to have that relationship with and if you ask him, he will change you into his image. But I believe that time is short. There are so many people I know that I know, and I'm sure people that you know as well, that don't know what we know, that don't have this understanding of a loving God. I mean, throughout, you know, within movies and media and everything we see, Satan uses these forms of media to show a God that is not true to his real character. They show this judgmental God. They show this 
God who wants to inflict pain on others. When his true nature is, he wants us to be happy. And so, unfortunately, the only reflection that they see of God, if, you know, those that don't open their Bible and read for themselves yet, they see a picture of God in us. So we really need to think of that each and every day. In fact, invite God into our hearts before we start our day so that we might have that opportunity to reflect Him to someone. We have a God that is eager to save. He does not want anyone to be lost. God is asking us to reflect His image. So let's reflect a loving God rather than a God that condemns. Let's focus on reconciliation, not condemnation. And I think of the, my favorite story in the Bible, the story of Joseph and his brothers, found in Genesis chapters 37 through 50. We have this, you know, the scene unfolds when we, we see that Joseph is kind of this favored son of the father, and in fact, Joseph is given these dreams of, you know, grains bowing down to him, or the stars, the moon bowing down to him, and so he kind of has these ideas of grandeur, and I think, I, I don't think that he was necessarily full of himself, but I think that um, maybe he was a little overly confident, um, but of course, God was, this, these were prophetic dreams that he was given to show how God was going to use him. But have you ever thought, you know, we always think about this story, how, you know, Joseph, brothers out of envy, eventually sell him into slavery, and he goes into Egypt, and then there was a famine in the land, right, and then, so then the brothers have to come back, uh, or they have to go to Egypt because, uh, through Joseph, uh, through a dream that was given to Pharaoh and through Joseph's interpretation and then his showing his abilities um, to, to make right choices to prepare for this famine while they're having these uh, years of plenty. And, um, and so they have to go to Egypt, right, to, to get bread because there wasn't any in, in Canaan where they were. So they go to Egypt and they interact with Joseph, and at first he doesn't let them know who he is, and he kind of tests them. And I don't know if you ever thought about it, but it's interesting if you kind of go through this story, and you think about um, the characters of, of Joseph's brothers, and how, you know, they went through these trials, uh, they went through these crucibles, as you might say, as we been talking about in Sabbath school, um, these, these things that caused them to develop characters that were more Christ-like. And, and at first, you know, it's amazing to think that any brother could sell their own brother into slavery. And I'm sure that they were guilt-ridden after that, especially when they had to go back to their father and they had to make up this big lie while handing you know, his coat of many colors to his father that was dipped in blood and saying that Joseph was killed by you know, some wild animals. I'm sure that they wrestled with that guilt for many, many years. And they had other things that happened with them. And especially Judah um, seemed to have a complete change of heart through this process of these things taking place with him. And... Um, and so I think that if you think about it, Christ was going to eventually come through the line of Judah. And so Judah needed to have, to develop a character, one that was not, you know, one that was self-sacrificing. And so that those genetics would be passed down to our Savior. And so I believe that this not only happened to, you know, that Israel would become a great nation, but that, you know, the ancestors, um, the, the human ancestors of our Savior would develop these characters that our, our Savior would ultimately show when he sacrificed his life for us. So I thought that was kind of interesting when you 
think of that story and seeing how Judah, you know, was willing to even take the place of his brother Benjamin. Instead of being willing to sell Benjamin off to, to the Egyptians, um, he was willing to take the place of Benjamin instead. And I have another story of the story of this man named Justin, who as a young kid, unfortunately was in a family of five, and his dad really didn't show Justin the love that he should have. In fact, he even told Justin that he didn't really want him to be in the home anymore. And so Justin, at a very young age, decided to leave home. I think he was 12 years old. It's interesting we're talking about 12 years old. Um, I mean, at 12 years old, I was getting baptized, actually. And to think that this poor kid was leaving his home at 12 years old. And he had fallen, and, well, to make ends meet, he started dealing drugs. And he started um, doing drugs as well. And he even joined a gang. He's in, he grew up in Lancaster, California. Apparently there are a few gangs there, and especially prevalent there are these skinhead gangs. And so he, gang, he joins this skinhead gang and is in and out of jail at such a young age. I think, I think he was 14 when the first time he was in jail. And uh, he was in trouble again, and he was going to be put into jail for 10 years. And it was either do that or join this group. I forget what the group's name was, but it was a Christian group. And it was out of South, South Central LA. And I don't know if you know much about skinheads, but um, they have issues with people of, that don't look like them. And in South Central LA, there are a lot of people that don't like, look like them. <laughs> and especially within this Christian organization. And so his, his biological mother, and actually a, a friend's mother who was caring for him or trying to, uh, persuaded him to do this program. So he gets into this program, and as soon as he goes in there, you know, he's a skinhead, he's got all these tattoos on him, still a very young man at this age. Um, and the, the pastor that he's meeting with is this African-American gentleman, and he's like, the pastor, as soon as he sees him, he sees these tattoos and knows what he's about. He's like, okay, your handcuffs are off you. You can leave right now. Or you can stay in this program. I'll give you a 15-minute head start. You can head out and run, and, and you'll be free for a time. But if you really want to be free, you need to stay in this program. And so he decides... You know, that day that he's going to stay, but the very next day, actually, he calls up a friend and has him pick him up, and usually, once you leave a program like that, they don't let you in again. Um, I mean, this was going to be, I think, his third strike, and he would have a lot longer sentence in store for him. And so, uh, again, his... You know, these two wonderful women in his life um, plead with him to go back. And he's like, well, I don't know at this stage if they'll let me back in. But, you know, there was a miracle. He went back, and they allowed him in, and he went through, the, he actually finished the program at this time. And he became a changed man. He realized that all children are God's children, that we are all the same. And the prejudice that he had melted away. And he found that there is a God that could even love him, despite all that he did, despite you know, the unfortunate ideas that were placed into his head at a young age. And so he was changed. He went from drugs and violence in jail to a loving Christian. And in fact, while in this program, even met his wife. And now he's a father as well. And although he still, he had 
you know, several lapses back into drugs. I mean, he was doing hard drugs. He was doing heroin. And, you know, he would, and, oh, I should also mention that within this program, he ended up becoming like the lead counselor to others because he had made such a change. But unfortunately, in talking with these other kids that were coming from similar experiences with drugs, that he found that he was desiring those drugs again the more he talked about them with other people. And so he would, you know, struggle going, you know, going back to them. But um, the latest that I heard this story, he still had been sober for uh, over a year and was really, you know, God was working on him. And I think all of us might have those struggles too. Sometimes we might fall back to some sins that we have given to God. But he'll take us back. Don't listen to the voice of Satan. Right? He's the accuser of the brethren. He's the one who's telling you that you're too sinful to go to God. Go to God as you are, and he will make the changes in you. We're not capable, right? I mean, Christ says, apart from me, you can do nothing. But with, with me, you can do all things. So I think about, you know, going back in our church history, thinking about the 1888 message, of Christ our righteousness, you know, of depending upon God for our righteousness, depending upon, uh, well, uh, that we would be righteous through our faith in Christ. And I think that you know, I just think of where we would be if in 1888 the leaders of the time would have practiced reconciliation instead of condemnation with Jones and Wagner when they were sharing the message of righteousness by faith or Christ or righteousness. It is possible that Christ would have perfected his character in us long ago and we would be enjoying heaven today. But now is the time. Now is the time to look to Christ to be changed, to reconcile our lives with Christ and all those around us. It's time to be changed into his image. Now is the time to prepare the way for the Lord, for he is coming quickly, and I believe that he is even at the door. So there's no time to waste. We have an opportunity we have a brother here who's going to be helping in some evangelistic campaign to pass out the great controversies. This give each one of us an opportunity to put our to test our faith, to grow in God. Actually, I want to tell you one more story. I don't have this on my PowerPoint here, but there's a story of this one gentleman who uh, wanted to be a coal porter, but he was a horrible stammerer. He, um, he just couldn't get any words out that anyone could actually understand. And he said, you know, you know, somehow he conveyed a message, maybe he wrote it down, I'm not sure, but he said, you know, I want to be used by God. I believe that even though I can't even speak, God will speak for me. He will be my mouth. And so he became this coal porter and he went out and he was showing numbers that nobody else could match. And they thought that he was fudging his numbers, that he was actually, you know, padding the numbers, that he really wasn't selling the books that he was saying that he was. And so one of the pastors said, you know what, I want to join this guy, go out with him and see what he does, see if this is, if he's being honest. And so he said, you know, okay, so you'll take one door and I'll do the next. And so what he found is before each door, what this gentleman would do is he would kneel down under a tree and he would pour his heart out to God, asking that God would use him. And, and he found that, you know, he would go to the door and, this, and he would, you know, try to go through his spiel, which was hardly audible, and somehow the people would just buy the books. And so this other pastor was like, wow, what's going on? He had to ask, you know, what is happening? What is causing you to buy these books? And they said, just the spirit would impress me that I needed to have these books. 
And I believe that the same thing could happen within this church when we go out with these books. Or whenever we do anything, you know, ministerial related that, you know, despite our shortcomings, God can make it happen. Right? We want that spirit to move. I mean, he will move mountains for us, right? We just need to have that faith of mustard seed. So I pray that, that we'll pray for that faith. That we'll put that faith to test. And that's how it will grow. Maybe our faith will grow from a mustard seed into a mountain. And then we'll fill these pews. Excuse me, can't speak. We'll fill these pews with many more people that are desiring to know Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Alright. Uh, before I pray, I, I want to mention one other thing. As I'm staring at Sandy over here, I've neglected to mention that we're getting an opportunity starting today after church to start. We're, uh, we're going to be delivering food, and we need to make, we need to package the food so that we can pass it out tomorrow. And I know we're busy. We have plans. We want to eat or what, whatnot. But let's just take a moment. If everyone just pitches in to put these things together, we can do it really quick. Uh, well, well, we're going to put them together right after church, correct, Sandy? Yes. So we're putting these together right after church. I think everything's set up to do that. We just need to go in there and um, just put everything in the bags. And then tomorrow at 1 o'clock, correct? Yes. 1 o'clock we'll be meeting at this church, and then we'll be distributing this food. And it... It's a blessing. I'm just, I'm telling you, I've, I've done it a few times, and it just gives you an opportunity. You know, people are super thankful when they come to get this much-needed food, and you could just, you know, just saying, you know, a nice positive word or, or uplifting their minds to God, just, you know, praise be to God, you know, or, or you know, who knows what, what the Spirit will move you to say. But you'll be able to maybe touch these hearts, and the community will see how much they need the Seventh-day Adventist Church in their community. That we're more, we're not about condemning others or being judgmental. We're about helping people where they are, right? Let's be like Christ, hoping that others will see us and desire to know Him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this message of reconciliation instead of condemnation. I pray, Lord, that although I'm not the most eloquent, I just pray, Lord, that the words would touch the hearts of those that were able to hear it, Lord. And I pray that you will stir up workers for you, Lord. We know that there is a lot of work to be done, but there are few workers willing to do it. Please give us the will to do your good.